it's okay uh, not to be okay. A few days ago, um, I was at a UK uh, train station and um, where I saw that uh, particular message and uh, several other um, messages that I get towards uh, improving uh, public awareness uh, regarding uh, mental health and uh, other related uh, issues all around the station. And uh, so uh, I decided to do some research uh, regarding this subject and uh, what I found uh, was quite uh, revealing because I read that um, in the UK uh, alone, uh, there are lots of deaths that are recorded uh, by suicide at train stations uh, alone uh, annually. But it's not just the only cause uh, of suicide uh, in the country, because uh, every year uh, about uh, 6,000 deaths uh, by suicide are recorded uh, in the UK, uh, which is uh, an average of about uh, 18 uh, suicides uh, per day. And uh, among the individuals, uh, that are above uh, the age of 45. I also found out that uh, suicide uh, is the biggest uh, cause of death uh, among men. And um, this is not just something uh, that is peculiar uh, to the UK alone, uh, because it's also uh, a globally relevant uh, issue. Because uh, according uh, to the uh, World Health uh, Organization, uh, nearly 700,000 uh, deaths uh, by suicide uh, are recorded annually. And uh, it's not just a an issue that affects which country alone, because the World Health Organization also reviewed that about two third of uh, deaths uh, by suicide uh, that is happening globally occurs in low and middle, middle, uh, middle income uh, countries. And which is a really important topic uh, to actually focus on. And this has to be done uh, properly. And it's not just individuals that are above 45 years alone, uh, because among individuals uh, that are between the ages of 15 and 19, uh, suicide is also the fourth leading uh, cause of death. And that is why uh, it is really, really critical for us uh, to put uh, the help focus on how journalists uh, report uh, these issues, because uh, when issues are not well reported, uh, it has direct impact and implications on how uh, the general public responds to it and how the government uh, is able uh, to handle uh, this uh, particular issue uh, by also endeavoring to give it uh, the more the attention that it truly, truly deserves. And there is no better case uh, for us uh, to actually drive attention to this subject today than uh, the story and uh, how journalists reported uh, Dr. Luna Bruin's uh, tragic death. Uh, personally for me, I did not hear uh, about Dr. Luna Bruin's story until when I was planning to interview a journalist uh, during the first wave uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And there has been a lot of uh, reactions regarding how the this particular issue was covered and uh, the, the way uh, the family has also used this to also drive attention uh, to the uh, to issues affecting uh, health care workers in the first uh, in, uh, subsequently has also been something uh, that is worthy of uh, talking shining our attention to today, which is why we have a very broad uh, panelist to discuss this critical issue uh, from different perspectives. And the first person I'll be introducing today uh, is Jay Corey Fist, uh, who is the co-founder of this uh, noble foundation uh, that is trying to bring attention uh, to the plight of frontline uh, health workers uh, in the US and by extension, the rest of the world. How are you doing today, Corey? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. And I'm really happy uh, that you can join us to share the noble work that is happening, uh, uh, especially regarding the Dr. Luna Brain Healthcare Provider uh, Protection Act, which is also making its way uh, to becoming uh, a federal law. So thank you very much. And uh, I also want to uh, 
introduce uh, Claudia. Claudia, is, uh, Claudia co-authored a very, very important publication that actually gave a true a, a, an analysis of how Dr. Brain's death was reported in the media. Hi, Claudia, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really happy that you can join us because the report that you co-authored uh, found that uh, top US news outlets uh, did a poor job uh, following um, best practices of uh, reporting on suicide. And uh, one of the key things that I took uh, from your publication was the fact that uh, uh, none of the articles that you reviewed uh, in, your public, uh, in, your, in your publication, none of them abided by more than 10 out of 15 recommendations. Actually, recommendations as simple as uh, stating that uh, providing guidelines on what to do and uh, stating that uh, suicide is also preventable. So this vacuum is also missing in how the world reports uh, suicide. So a third uh, panelist that we have on this per, uh, on this uh, webinar today uh, is Victor Schwarz, who comes highly recommended by the American Association of Suicidology. And uh, so how are you doing today, Victor? I'm doing okay, Paul. Nice to be here with you. And I hope to uh, participate in what I hope will be an interesting discussion. Yes, um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for joining us. And last but not the least, uh, we have somebody uh, from the organization that is responsible for that message I mentioned uh, at the how that is at the outset of my of my discussion today, I'm talking about uh, Samaritans. And uh, Samaritans uh, is well represented there because they've always they've also been having actively engaging journalists, especially in the UK, on how to report on suicide. And I like to welcome uh, Lona Frazier. How are you doing, Lona Frazier? Hi, very good, thank you. And um, thank you for the opportunity to, to join you today um, to talk about a really important topic, uh, reporting of suicide. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. So my first question, uh, I would like to start with Corey. And uh, because uh, Corey uh, is not just uh, interested in uh, calling attention to this uh, issue, because it's also something that he and his uh, loved ones uh, had to deal with how journalists report this issue. So I would like to uh, well, with that, because it's really, really important to this uh, conversation, I would like to, to uh, give your personal assessment of uh, how the family dealt with this and uh, what you think the role of the media was, how the media carried out uh, its function and what you think journalists can do much better. That's a, it's an excellent question and thank you for this opportunity. When I, when I received your uh, request to be on this panel, I was really um, overjoyed with the opportunity to, to come back and, and, and speak to this audience because I think there was a lot to there's a lot that can be learned from this story. Um, you know, first, I, I assume most most people who are watching understand or have at least just since you started this podcast or this uh, this Facebook Live, um, have Googled Dr. Breen's name. Dr. Lorna Breen was a physician in New York City. She um, trained her whole life to be a physician in New York City. She was running a very busy emergency department. And in a period of three weeks went from, um, contracting COVID herself to trying to recover and then found herself overwhelmed in the emergency department describing what she saw as Armageddon and was so overwhelmed and so overcome by the stigma associated with even taking a break that she kept pushing on um, 15 hour days, no sleep, no rest until she finally broke. Um, Lorna was admitted to the University of Virginia's psychiatric unit and spent about 10 days there and then tragically took her life um, a few days after being discharged, um, citing the fear of the impact of her on her medical license and of getting by getting psychiatric help um, and really her career being over as, as one of the real drivers for her decision. Um, what I would share with you all are, are just a few things. Um, want a, a couple about the foundation, but but I want to speak about the the role that media has had in the in in publishing this story because it has predominantly been very good from the family's perspective, but it started on a really tough and sour note. So 
just a little bit about the foundation. Um, we are now a tax exempt foundation um, in the United States. It's called a 501c3 designation. Our focus has been on protecting the well being of the healthcare workforce. Um, our efforts have been on focusing on eliminating stigma and the barriers that prevent clinicians from seeking mental health support. And one of the reasons why I want to focus on that is because without the help of the media in, in making this issue that, um, that, that, that really was at the cause of Dr. Breen's death or one of the big contributors, without the media's help in sharing that story, we wouldn't, the, the, I, I believe the United States wouldn't be where we are right now and having these conversations as open as they have been. And I, and I just wanna share with you again on the, on, the, on the positive side, if you ever wonder the impact of the media and how, how important it is to get these stories right, I wanna to read to you two quotes that came to me from people who read this story. One came from a physician who said, today, I want to thank you, say how thankful I am that the, the, Fear, the Heroes Foundation exists. I'm sure you now understand some of the restrictions that exist, which prevent physicians from reaching out for help when we need it. Lorna's death was what pushed me to get help, the details of which I still don't talk about because I continue to fear it will be held against me. I finally saw my physical safety as more important than my psychological safety something that in retrospect seemed impossible after a life of delayed gratification. Every time I see a picture of her, I see it myself, I see my residents, and I see my colleagues. I wanted to share that with you because, those quotes with you, because if we weren't telling this story as publicly as we have been telling it, people wouldn't have had the opportunity to see in themselves what uh, Lorna's story. And so you have helped us amplify this story in ways that we never would have thought imaginable. We have reached over 70 million people across the world. We have only published 11 national publications, but this, is, this story has been referenced in now hundreds and hundreds of journals. Um, but let me, so let me talk about our journey as a family because candidly, it was one of the hardest things that I ever did um, was to try to not have this story told. Um, so when Lorna died on the 26th of April, um, we were completely in shock. The family had not seen this coming. We thought she was doing better. And this happened in the blink of an eye. And we didn't really even understand what had happened to her. And, and we were still in, a, in shock. Nonetheless, about 10 hours after she died, I got a message from a friend of hers who had been contacted by the New York Times. Now this friend had worked for the New York Times before and said that there had been discussions about publishing the, the, the story already and the cause of death. So I found myself within an hour of that phone call pleading with an editor not to publish this story because the family was so in shock. We didn't know what had happened. We were just overwhelmed by, with grief and shock and stigma. The stigma of suicide is pervasive. The stigma of mental health in this world, in this country, in the United States is also significant. But the stigma of suicide is very personal. It has religious connotations. It, it is very, very personal. And for me to be literally in the chair you see over my shoulder, bawling my eyes out, pleading with an editor not to publish the cause of death please, there is no need to publish this 12 hours after this individual died. And for that to be received with, sorry, we published six minutes ago and we don't take it down, was heartbreaking. And for me to have to walk out of this room and walk into my wife and my mother-in-law's arms and tell them that this was now national news and international news, 
was one of the most heartbreaking things that I had ever done. All that said, and then late, and then about uh, ten hours after that, we found um, we found that it had been picked up and it was all over. And so, at that moment of extreme grief, my wife and I made a decision, which was that we would. And and by that time, we were literally drawing the shades on the house. We were being circled. Our house was being circled by reporters, and media was showing up. And we were hiding, um, again, not wanting to talk to anyone. My phone was going crazy. People had gotten my phone number. I was getting calls at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, wanting to speak. And my wife and I decided that we would tell the story on our own terms. And we went on the Today Show. Now, when we did that, we did that because we had a personal connection with Savannah Guthrie from the Today Show. And that was the only way we were going to be able to tell the story in a way that we felt comfortable doing that. And she was incredibly delicate with that story. So if you go back and you look at the first reporting of that interview, we recorded that 48 hours after, the, after Dr. Breen's death. It aired 72 hours after her death. And it was really done in, as a reaction by us to this extreme, um, you know, to a, frankly an unnecessary reporting of the cause of her death so quickly um, without any, um, any real thought of the impact that it was having on the family in that moment. Following, following all of that initial publicity, we then, received what I would call an overwhelming cry for help from the healthcare community itself on the issues, which then caused us to stay in this arena and have these conversations and try to, try to ultimately create a foundation and help. Throughout the course of that first summer, the summer of 2020, we extensively worked with some major news outlets in the United States, Vanity Fair, the New York Times, the Washington Post and others to tell a, a story that we felt was appropriate because we didn't want this to be a sensationalized suicide. Dr. Breen was much more than just this one moment in her, in her 49 years of life. She was, a, she was an author, she was an educator, she was an incredible physician. And for this to be a sensationalized suicide was not doing justice to the life that she led to the physicians to the patients that she saved over her whole life. And so what I would say to you is that from following that initial significant misstep, every single reporter that we talked to, every single journalist that we talked to was highly respectful of the lines that we drew. Um, we, we always said, we don't talk about the day she died. We can tell you anything else, but it's too painful for us to talk about the day she died. We drew that line in the sand and we said, anything else we'll tell you if we're not comfortable. Uh, my wife and I are both attorneys, so we don't have problem doing that. But ever since then, the conversation that we had with our, with, and the publicity that I have seen has been very respectful of the family's wishes. And so I, I maybe I'll turn it back over to you, Paul, for, for further discussion here, because I know that that, um, that others have something to share. And I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that folks have, but thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And, um, and thank, thank, thank you all who are watching this for learning about this and for being um, thoughtful um, in, in, your, in your coverage of these issues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Corey, uh, for that. Uh, for that. Um, for sharing that with us, we do appreciate it. And it's really, really important um, for journalists to actually have a bigger understanding of and the implications of what um, their reports um, can do, especially to families uh, affected um, that are really close uh, to the person involved in the story. And um, so Claudia, um, 
Claudia, like we said, uh, co-authored uh, the case study that found that top US media um, outlets uh, covering Dr. Brin's uh, death uh, did a poor job of adhering to uh, breast practices recommendations uh, for reporting on suicide. And uh, which is why I'm bringing her now to, uh, to also share what uh, she found out and uh, the insights uh, from my understanding of how journalists are reporting on suicide. So Claudia, how, um, should we start with the presentation that you have? Sure, can you, can you all see my screen right now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for having me and allowing me to talk about this topic. Um, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make a disclaimer up top that this presentation will also contain discussion of suicide and if you or someone you know needs support, there are plenty of resources. And I know that this is an international audience. So um, suicide.org provides a lot of international hotlines that um, if you need help or you want to guide someone, that's a good place to go. Um, so yeah, I um, conducted research on specifically the case study of uh, the media coverage of Dr. Lerner Breen's death. Um, and it was inspired by uh, last April, one of my friends uh, who is, uh, was a first year medical student at the time came to me um, and expressed her concern over the way that she saw this specific death being covered. And the reason she was disturbed is because um, of the sensationalized way that the media, um, that the mainstream media she was seeing was talking about it. And she was aware that a major risk caused by media coverage of suicide is contagion. Um, there's plenty of research that shows that the irresponsible reporting can contribute to imitation suicides. For example, a 2018 study um, found that the suicide rate in the U.S. increased by nearly 10% in the six months following the widely covered death of actor and comedian Robin Williams. And healthcare workers are already at a higher risk of suicide compared to other professions. And then this is likely being exacerbated by the pressures of the pandemic. So we decided to use Dr. Lorna Breen's study um, story, sorry, as a case study to try to identify patterns and trends in media coverage. Um, and the way we did that was by focusing on um, modeling our research after previous papers that had scored articles covering the deaths of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain based on their adherence to the recommendations for reporting on suicide. So this guide was first developed in 2011 and has, been, has evolved since then. Um, it was developed by Dr. Dan Riedenberg, who is a suicidologist alongside um, journalists and other um, professionals in this field. Um, and it provides advice for how to ensure that the content, tone, and framing of suicide reporting is respectful. And all of these recommendations are aimed at preventing contagion. So this includes steps that prevent harm, such as avoiding sensationalizing, avoiding including specific details about someone's death, and using preferred language such as saying died by suicide instead of committed suicide because that implies that it is an illegal act. But beyond that, it also includes opportunities to create benefit by avoiding framing suicide as inexplicable or having a single cause, um, spotlighting crisis resources and information about coping skills, support and treatment, and also sharing a hopeful message. So you can read our findings in Crisis, the Journal of Crisis Prevention and Suicide, sorry, crisis intervention and suicide prevention. And I also wrote a piece about it for the objective, which was later picked up by ICFJ and translated into multiple languages on IJNet. Um, so in our paper, we analyzed articles published by top outlets in the days following Dr. Breen's death and found that on average, every article violated at least five of the 15 guidelines and some adhered to as few as two of 15. And seven of the 15 total guidelines were adhered to in fewer than one third of the article. And something like including the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number, which is very easy to do at the end of an article, only appeared in 75% of the articles. And one of the most striking findings is that none of the articles that we reviewed provided a hopeful message that suicide is preventable. Um, one moment, sorry. Uh, one of the worst offenders was the New York Daily News. Um, these flashy headlines that included specific details about the death and prominently displayed photos of the deceased, all of which go against the recommendations. 
Um, the New York Post coverage defied several recommendations in the headline alone, which was very sensationalist. Top Manhattan ER doc commits suicide shaken by coronavirus onslaught. And the New York Times too oversimplified the cause of death and glamorized the suicide by including language of heroism, which, which is discouraged in the recommendation. So journalists are not advocates or activists, but we do have a duty of care not to cause unnecessary harm to our subjects and our audiences. And for this reason, it's important that we be educated about how some of the tactics that we typically employ to make a story more engaging or relatable to a reader can actually be counterproductive and even dangerous when it comes to reporting on suicide. The AP style book, which is sort of the universal handbook for a lot of journalists, discourages reporting on suicide altogether unless the person involved is a well-known figure or the circumstances are particularly unusual or disruptive. But um, because of the standard, few journalists regu regularly report on suicide. And so when they do do so, they are not prepared, not often not prepared to do so in a responsible way. They're not aware of these recommendations. And the coverage of Dr. Green's deaths illustrates how traditional journalistic instincts can run counter to the public interest when it comes to reporting on suicide. So the recommendations for reporting on suicide go beyond preventing harm by providing opportunities to create benefit. And they encourage reporters to avoid framing suicide as an inexplicable or having a single cause, and instead to include crisis resources, information about coping skills, support, treatment, um, and, and overall give people a sense of hope. And when I spoke to Dr. Dan Riedenberg, he stressed that it's not only possible, but imperative for us to sensitively and accurately report stories about people who died without glamorizing or falling back on harmful tropes. Um, and one of the ways to do so is by helping the audience understand why someone might have died by focusing on the systemic issues around the training of physicians, for example, for the long hours that they work for the pressures and demands that they're under, especially during the pandemic. And um, as conversations about suicide prevention become more commonplace in society, we must make space in the editorial process for considering how journalists play a role in this effort and bringing this conversation into the newsroom and having these discussions in, in the decision-making process, in the editing process, and finally, when we decide to publish a story. Um, and though there's certainly been progress in the 10 years since the recommendations have been developed, um, there's still so much room for improvement. And one of the biggest things that we really need to do is, is emphasize that there is hope that if someone is suicidal, that's often a temporary state. And if they're given the right resources, they will not follow down that path. And journalists are in a position like um, Corey said before, to amplify positive messages. And I think we really need to embrace that role and, and be able to do so. And so by reflecting on these publications mistakes and the potential, potentially grave consequences can help us avoid repeating them in the future. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Claudia, uh, for that presentation. Uh, before we go to Lona, uh, who has uh, really, uh, whose organization has really been thorough about helping journalists to better report on suicide, I would like to quickly bring in uh, Victor. And, um, so the first question I have uh, for Victor is, um, from what we've heard from Corey and uh, Claudia, uh, um, from what we've heard from uh, Glory, uh, uh, from Korea and Gloria, what do you consider to be, um, what do you consider to be the major mental health implication um, of poor reporting on suicide? And who do you think uh, has better morals in fixing these anomaly? Well, uh, thanks, Paul. And, um, you know, in a way, I'm going to make a couple of comments in response to your question that almost serve as a kind of introduction to the comments that Corey and Claudia made, because, you know, the two issues, as they've pointed out in reporting on suicide in the media, are sensitivity to the feelings of friends and family, 
so the capacity of reporting to be hurtful or painful or, or simply share things that the family uh, doesn't want to be in the public domain. And, and the more general kind of public health element of this is the issue that Claudia raised around the risk of contagion. Uh, that can come as a consequence, and that's well studied. People uh, like uh, Madeline Gould, actually from Columbia, uh, has been one of the leading figures in, in unpacking the risk of contagion uh, based on how suicide is portrayed uh, both in journalistic settings and in the media. Uh, and to give you a couple of framing principles, Claudia went through the, the kind of do's and don'ts of this, but I think people sometimes find those challenging to understand, uh, but they can be really better understood if you think about them in terms of uh, everything that is the natural impulse of a journalist in writing a story is actually problematic when reporting on suicide. So what I mean is that uh, when a journalist reports on any story, their goal is to create a compelling mental picture of a narrative event, you know, or a series of events. They want, the, ideally in a really good story, they want to move their audience. They want their audience, for uh, lack of a better term, I'm going to use a psychological term, which is, I think, though fairly common, it's called identification. In a sense, when you're telling a story about somebody, you want the audience, the reading audience, the consuming audience to identify with either the events of the story or the person. Uh, and that's precisely what you don't want to have happen when you're reporting on a suicide. So th the challenge is, again, going against the instincts of drawing a detailed and emotionally compelling story about either the person who's died, the method of death, or the circumstances of their death. And that if you go back now and look at the recommendations, all of those things are really kind of meant to direct the writer or you know, the person doing the, the, the video or whatever it is, away from those kinds of impulses to in a sense make the reporting as unincendiary as possible. I know that that's not a word, but I think it's close. Uh, you wanna make it not emotionally compelling. You don't want to, as Claudia mentioned, portray the person who's died as some kind of tragic heroic figure because you don't want that small population. And it's important for people to understand that you know, the, the contagion risk is small statistically but that said, with a large enough consuming audience, something that's happening, you know, 0.01% of the time with a couple of million people is going to result in a certain number of deaths. That was, I mean, the, the, the other most compelling example of this was not journalism, but the recent example of the uh, Netflix show 13 Reasons Why which in fact, if you look through this list and if you're familiar with that series, what was a, a very, very problematic presentation, although their intent was to be educating young people about mental health. So if you portray suicide as a simple and inevitable result to life stresses or strains or to a single stimulus, if you portray suicide as a crisis or epidemic, which again gives this sense of inevitability of it or commonness of it, you're actually increasing risk for a small, unpredictable, but significant, because the consequences are so tragic, percentage of the consuming audience. And that's where the risk is. We do know that, as Claudia mentioned, there is something called the Papageno effect, uh, which is actually based on a, a character from Mozart's The Magic Flute, that stories portrayed with a sense of hopefulness that help is available, that this is all complicated, but that you know, in many cases things you know, are addressed and do get better, you can actually lower the risk of suicide for the consuming audience. Of course, when you're reporting about an actual suicide, it's very difficult to convey that in a, in a hopeful context because you know, a death, a tragic death has occurred. So um, 
that you know that's a way of thinking about what these principles are trying to convey uh, and it is challenging for journalists because it really runs against the standard grain of how you've been taught to tell stories or report on stories but it really can make a significant difference and obviously for some people it can make a life and death difference so I'll stop there and uh, you know obviously there's way more to talk about in this regard but hopefully these sort of organized principles are enough to at least explain why these principles exist. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so before I go to uh, other panelists, I, this is also an important element of, um, of uh, reporting on suicide, and uh, which is well, something I'd like uh, Victor to still uh, shed more light on. Um, regarding uh, suicide uh, and the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, are there key, any aspect of these uh, that you think journalists that is not receiving attention? And uh, what do you think has been the impact of the pandemic generally on uh, mental health and uh, suicide in particular? Vita, are you with us? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if you were asking, asking me. You're moving ahead to Lorna. <laughs> You know, uh, so actually one of the concerns that I've had about the way uh, the mental health impact of COVID has been covered uh, is that there has been a little bit of a kind of hysterical undercurrent to much of the reporting. You know, there you, you see frequent uh, articles about, you know, the impending crisis in mental health. Uh, and um, and the inevitable increase in suicides, which in fact has not been seen, at least in the United States. I mean, interestingly, um, in 2020, uh, the best, you know, the CDC statistics suggest that in 2020, rates of suicide actually decreased slightly. And, you know, problematically, though, th there was a kind of uh, bimodal distribution, which is to say uh, frontline workers, people who were directly impacted uh, by COVID, people who were sick or had uh, family members who were sick or died, uh, people who were in frontline medical positions, you know, the delivery people, workers who, who were forced to stay, and people whose uh, economic lives were dramatically impacted did there is suggestions that among those people suicide risk increased but for others it decreased uh, so you know we have to be very careful in jumping to conclusions about things based on kind of everybody is saying this uh, and also I think it's it's been a mistake not to distinguish between stress and symptoms of anxiety and depression which understandably have been increased We've been, in a sense, mourning for both pe many people who've died and mourning for a way of life for the last year and a half. And I think it's a mistake to characterize that as mental illness or psychopathology. So people are anxious and sad and angry and, you know, and worried and frustrated. I don't think it's accurate or helpful to convey or to portray those things as mental illness unless they're really getting to a point where they're having a functional impact on someone in, in significant ways. Yeah, so um, before we spend a lot of time, uh, before I spend a lot of time talking to uh, Victor, uh, and uh, I know we are, we'll be taking a presentation uh, from Lona on uh, that is uh, that rides on uh, Samaritans experience in responding to uh, uh, I think Samaritans has a, a very robust uh, call center uh, that interacts with individuals in need of someone to talk to and on the other flip on the flip side so they've also been uh, directly engaging with uh, journalists uh, so that they can improve uh, how they report on suicide so if you are joining us uh, on the queue on the zoom platform and you have any questions I've already I've seen a lot of questions already uh, but if you are still waiting for the time to uh, for the for the prompt 
to know when to put in your questions please uh, type you put use the Q&A uh, function on the zoom platform for your questions and if you are watching us on the Facebook live stream the comment box below the video uh, is where you can put your questions in and we are going to deal with them uh, as soon as possible and uh, before Lena presents uh, what uh, what she would like to share with us I have a question for her and um, which is um, as we've heard from all our presenters there are some key aspects key things that are important uh, for responsible reporting on on suicide and uh, but there are also uh, requirements for journalism uh, reports and uh, do you uh, in your interactions with uh, journalists do you see these uh, two very very important pillars uh, colliding and uh, what do you think um, it can be actively done to ensure that as journalists are upholding the pillars of journalism they are also not contravening the requirements for responsible reporting on suicide thank you for that and um you know this is a, a constant um challenge really but um i mean overall adhering to media guidelines, being aware of the risks and, and how you can either avoid those risks entirely or uh, in some cases how you might be able to minimise the risk. Um, adhering to media guidelines, following those um, will really help you to, to make sure that your reports are as safe as possible. Um, and I think, you know, there's been some really important, um, interesting points raised around the challenges that journalists face, um, particularly um, what Victor was saying around needing to create compelling um, stories that people identify with, um, and, and indeed, you know, this, this, this issue, these challenges spread across outside of news reporting across drama. We, we've heard about 13 Reasons Why as an example. Um, so, yeah, I think the thing is that being aware of media guidelines, being familiar with those and following the rules as much as you can, there are always ways around these things to make sure that your reports are as safe as possible. Um, I'm just quickly going to share some I've got a small number of slides to go through. Um, can, can you see my slides? OK. Yes, but can you use a present? Yeah, I'll just change that to present. So I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, a little bit about suicidal behaviour and contagion. Um, I'll, I'll also touch on some of the research examples, um, the research into media portrayals of suicide, which is known as the, the Werther or Furter effect. Um, and I'll just very briefly touch on Samaritan's work in this area and the resources that we have available for journalists. Um, so there's lots of research that has been carried out across the world over the last six decades now um, that has shown very clear links between certain types of media coverage of suicide and increases in suicide rates. Um, I must stress that it is certain types of media coverage. The research doesn't suggest that suicide shouldn't be covered in the media. Um, as long as it's done responsibly and it's done sensitively, the media can be a really powerful force for good in terms of raising awareness, improving public understanding of these issues, helping people to look out for each other, encouraging people to reach out for help. Um, and, you know, as I think it was Claudia mentioned, there is also a body of research that has been known as the Papagena effect that has actually linked um, hopeful stories of recovery to falls in suicide rates. Um, so it, it's not suggesting that we shouldn't cover the topic, but it's very much about how the topic is covered. And what the research has shown is that you will see when this effect, this contagious effect happens, you will see statistically over what you would expect to see of the number of suicides in a limited time period, or within a geographic location, or perhaps an institution like a university, or you might see um, an uptake in the use of a particular suicide method. And, and how this comes about, this effect, is 
through social learning, people who are more vulnerable to the effect of suicide contagion through media coverage. And this includes people who struggle with their mental health, people who are bereaved, particularly those who are bereaved by suicide, and young people. Young people, for a number of reasons, are a particularly vulnerable audience. Um, and, and we may get time to come on to talk about that. We'll have to see. Um, but what happens is people who are more vulnerable to this effect will over identify with certain characteristics or the circumstances of those who are reported to have died and, and may start to feel that perhaps this is a suitable option for them. Um, you know, and bearing in mind that we're often talking about people who here who have lost all hope, who have lost sight of their life ever feeling OK again. Um, and then believing that suicide may be their only option. So th this is just some of the examples of the research. Um, so the top study there is an example of a, a brand new suicide method being introduced into Hong Kong um, following widespread reporting um, of a woman's death by this method. And because the reports named the suicide method and included details of how this had been obtained and administered. That suicide method, the study showed, went from being unheard of to becoming the second most commonly used suicide method in that country and also spread to neighbouring countries. Um, the next examples, we have a couple of drama examples. Um, so a railway example, this was where a, a drama series showed a railway suicide as the intro to this drama series. So every episode and, and following the broadcast, there was a significant increase in rail suicides in Germany where the drama was shown. Um, and, and the next example being um, the 13 Reasons Why, the Netflix drama series, which not only showed a very dangerous suicide portrayal, um, but also the whole storyline of the drama was presented as suicide was an, an inevitable outcome. And it also presented suicide as a kind of romanticized revenge theory. Um, so really unhelpful example and uh, example and um, targeting of a young age group. So a, a very dangerous example. Um, then we've got a couple of um, celebrity examples. So um, there was the German goalie, Robert N.K., who died on the railway. And following reports of his death, there was a, a dramatic increase in railway suicides in Germany. Um, but then we have another... Um, celebrity example, a singer this time, where there was an increase in suicide and, and by the same demographic following his death. Um, there's the Robin Williams example, which Claudia mentioned earlier. And interestingly, that study drew three comparisons with how the death of his death was reported compared with how the death of Kurt Cobain was reported. And those three elements were firstly around the suicide method. So in the case of Robin Williams, there were lots of details about the suicide method, perhaps because at the time the coroner came out and gave a live press conference. And in that conference, which press were live streaming to, he gave a very detailed step by step of account of exactly how Robin Williams had hanged himself. Um, whereas comparatively, in the case of Kurt Cobain, there were very few details reported. Um, secondly, the, 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 the suicide preventative narrative um, didn't really appear in, in the reports of Robin Williams' death, whereas in the case of Kurt Cobain, th th there was lots of that. And the third comparison was around the, 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 the tone, the, the nature of the reports. And in the case of um, Kurt Cobain, the reports were very factual, sticking to the facts. Um, whereas in the case of Robin Williams, the reports were very romanticized in the tone and the language. Um, and, and we know that the US Film Academy released a statement shortly, up, shortly after he died saying, Jeannie, you're free. So preventing, presenting this kind of romanticized idea of this tortured soul having freed himself from all of his troubles in life by killing himself, which is a really unhelpful, toxic 
message to give in relation to suicide. Um, whereas comparatively in, the case, comparatively in the case of Kurt Cobain, his wife, Courtney Love, came out at the time of his death speaking to the press and speaking in very real terms about the significant mental illness that he suffered with. So his, his death was reported in much, much more um, safer language, just in real terms and sticking to the facts. The next example that I've got there is the research summary example that was published only last year. And this was a study that looked at um, research already published, mostly celebrity deaths. Um, and this study found that when a celebrity dies, following reports of their, de their death, you will consistently see a 13% increase in suicides in the one to two months after their death. If the suicide method is reported, the, that average goes up to 30%. So that's 30% of suicides by the same method. Um, so we know from this study that sadly celebrity deaths have a much greater likelihood of influencing suicide contagion. Um, people are much more likely to identify with a celebrity figure. So, you know, there is an increased risk there. And also importantly, what we can see from that study is talking about suicide methods really matters. Um, the most dangerous areas of reporting of suicide from all of the research and all of Samaritan's work in this area, which has been going on now for um, nearly three decades, um, the most dangerous areas are talking about suicide methods. That's the greatest risk area, but also sensationalizing stories. So sensationalizing stories by um, reporting or speculating around potential causes of a death um, or potentially oversimplifying suicidal behavior. Um, and, and also excessive numbers of reports is an added risk factor. Um, the, the other bullet point there that I've got around influences on choice of method, um, that there is a much smaller body of research evidence that has been carried out because all of those studies that I've covered so far have been quantitative research following often widespread reporting. But there are also some studies, fewer studies, but these qualitative studies where people who have uh, survived um, a very serious suicide attempt have been interviewed. And in those interviews, they've been asked about what influenced their decision to make a suicide attempt, and also what influenced their choice of suicide method. And they have spoken about um, learning about suicide methods through news reports, and, and sometimes holding onto that information for a long period of time. So it may be that when they read that report, they weren't vulnerable at the time, but six months or however long later when they were, they reverted back to that information that they remembered reading about or hearing about. Um, so learning the information about how to end your life. But they have also spoken about having their perception of what it might be like to die by suicide or what it might be like to die by a particular suicide method having that perception altered by either a news report or, or also by film and drama. So for example, the suggestion of a character having died peacefully, having taken an overdose, it is quite a dangerous portrayal to give. Um, and the last point there, that there is a, a lot of research that I'm aware of anyway, around the impact, the effectiveness of media guidelines of, of following that guidance. Um, but this was a study that was carried out in Vienna. So following the introduction of the subway system in Vienna, they started to see rises in subway suicides. And when it was recognized that there was a correlation between how these incidents were being reported and the rises of incidents that they were seeing, media guidelines were developed and meetings were held with the press. And after the point in time when those media guidelines were launched, there was a significant decrease in subway suicides, which was sustained over a long period of time. So there is some evidence to show the effectiveness of adhering to this advice. Um, and this is just a useful study in showing that following um, 
at, say, a spike in the use of a particular suicide method, for example, following um, a re reports of a celebrity death where the suicide method was named, what you won't see is a corresponding decrease across other suicide methods. So we are talking about an increase in suicide deaths overall following reporting. And uh, as we, I and Claudia have both mentioned, you know, it, it, we're not suggesting that sh suicide shouldn't be covered. It's very much about how it's covered, adhering to the media guidelines that are available um, and, and, you know, getting more of these kind of stories of recovery. The World Health Organization estimates for every person who dies by suicide across the world, there are perhaps upwards of 20 who will make a suicide attempt. So in actual fact, far more people are surviving this than those who die by suicide. And that's the story that's not told in the news. Certainly it's not told enough and we need to see more of these because from what we, I, I've explained about social learning and people identifying with, with characters who have died by suicide, exactly the same effect can be um, influenced by talking about people who have survived, um, encouraging people that there is light at the tunnel, there is help out there and you can get through this. So more of these kinds of examples, reminding people of all of those really important things and also reminding people to have these important conversations. So that's not just encouraging people to reach out for help if they're struggling to cope. That's also encouraging people to have a conversation, to start a conversation if they're worried about somebody that they know, because people can be um, often can be apprehensive to do that, not knowing if they'd be saying the right thing. But, but you know, it, there's no saying the right thing. So we would really encourage more of those kinds of stories. And just very quickly, um, touching on the resources that Samaritans has available for journalists, um, our main media guidelines document, it's a, a best practice comprehensive guide of how to avoid the risks and how to report suicide safely. Um, it was first published back in 1994, so it's been around a long time, um, and we, we revised that and published our sixth edition of that document last year. We also have an e-learning tra training programme available on our website for journalists, and lots of um, specific guidance documents. So, for instance, we have a guide that is specifically covering how to report celebrity suicides safely, um, one that talks about how to cover youth suicide safely, and a number of other topics that you can see there. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that that's been helpful. And thank you for taking the time out of your day and taking an interest in um, what is a really important, um, as you can see from the research evidence, a really important topic for you to understand if this is something that you're going to be reporting on. Yeah, uh, thank you um, very much, um, Lona, for, for that very, uh, useful um, presentation. And talking about, um, I think, uh, something that I think is quite uh, consistent with what our panelists have been showing and been telling us today is the fact that indirectly, uh, the search for reporting the entire details that journalists are used to could actually be contributing uh, to uh, providing more information to individuals that are uh, contemplating it right now or in the future uh, to uh, to die by suicide. So I did one, and it's actually quite challenging. I'm going to show one little experiment that I did right now. I will look at the screen. This is the Google uh, search uh, box. So if you type how to quickly commit uh, suicide, for say, uh, people usually go to Google uh, just for information, and you run it. Um, the first thing that pops up is this peculiar box that shows that help is available, speak with someone today. And you can see Samaritan's uh, call center, and uh, it's quite important. Many of the information that you see are actually supportive. But until you look at um, what you have on, um, 
on Wikipedia that is actually <laughs> uh, crazily thorough about referring uh, individuals to sources of information. So when I opened what Wikipedia had, you could see that it has tons of pages that actually describes this. So the first question I have goes to Lona. It's really good that your, your, your organization is using multiple platforms to reach out to people about mental health awareness and to also encourage them uh, to seek uh, help. Uh, but um, to what, what do you still think needs to be done, not just by uh, journalists, but by other platforms through which people can access information? So, um, I mean, we also have an area of work. I, I lead our work with mainstream media, so working with journalists, dramas, program makers, and so on. But we do also have an online harms team um, who, who started about two years ago. And so they are doing exactly the same work, but with the platforms. So like you just showed with Google, we have a partnership with Google that brings up our, that the helpline number when people are searching on helpful terms. Um, but, but really, it's not my area of expertise, but what Why I do that... know is, no, that what we know is that we need to know more about what makes the online environment a safer place. Um, and so our online harms te team have commissioned lots of research evidence around this. The research evidence around media portrayals of suicide is, is ex ex you know, extensive because it's been happening for the last 60 years across the world um, but we need more research evidence around the online environment because as we know it's not as simple as just shutting things down because there, there are lots of harmful sites and, and unhelpful information but we also know that people get really valuable support online um, so you know we mustn't deter that um, but I think, I mean, in the UK, we have the online harms bill, which um, is running at the moment. And we hope that once that comes in, that, that, that platforms we, will be under stricter guidance or regulation. I'm not sure how it's going to play out, um, but making them more accountable for the content on their platforms. Um, so, so, yeah, okay. and, you know, lots that needs to be done there. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we go straight into the questions, lots of them that we have already. So anybody that wants to pick uh, to answer a question, uh, anybody's free to quickly jump in so that we can save time. The first question I'll be reading out is it, uh, is it okay to present statistics while reporting stories about suicide? I mean, I'm happy to say our, our view on that. Um, so, yes, it is OK to talk about statistics about suicide, but that really needs to be done with great care. Um, and, and we actually, because of that, we do actually have a section covering statistics in our media guidelines, um, because what we need to avoid is sensationalising the issue um, or normalising suicidal behaviour with, with, within certain groups. Um, and we really appreciate that that can be a real challenge because, it, you know, that, that there is a need through media coverage to raise the importance of an issue. Um, but, but it is something that needs to be done, handled with great care. OK. Uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on this? Okay, so we'll move to the next question. Uh, if the suicide uh, survivor are willing uh, to disclose their identity, is it okay to report their stories on national media? I've got some thoughts on that again. Just quickly, what I would say is, yes, it is okay to identify them because as I said, you know, from this idea of social learning, if it's a story of recovery, really you want people to identify with that person so that you know it, it will resonate with them um, and, and hopefully instill in them the belief that they can get through this that there is light at the end of the tunnel um, so it, that one of the important things to bear in mind when you're working with people who are sharing their lived experience of suicide is that you hold the responsibility for the information that they share as a journalist because they may not, it's unlikely that they would be aware of the, the weather research um, or of media guidelines and the risks in this area of potentially impact on, impacting on people in a negative way. 
Um, so, you know, extra care really is needed there to make sure that no information that could put anybody at harm is shared. Okay. Um, does anybody want to add anything? Uh, well, the only thing I would, uh, a small point I would add is it's also valuable to convey the impact that suicide attempts or suicides have on the people around someone, on their family, on their friends, on their social universe. So adding that perspective in, in those kinds of stories can be extremely helpful. And Paul, if I could just add, um, we've been contacted this past year by many families of physicians who have died by suicide, and some have asked us about talking about it. And, and I would make two points there. Um, if we had never talked publicly about my sister-in-law's death, that would have been, we would have buried it, if you will, and, and held on to that as one deep, dark secret. And to go through this experience um, and have that secret as on top of the burden of the loss I can't even, it would have been unimaginable for me. So we have encouraged families who are comfortable speaking about the, the fact that someone died by suicide to, to name it. And and because I think that also helps with the stigma and frankly, just the burden of walking around with that, that deep, dark secret. But we've also worked with them to find news outlets who will be delicate and thoughtful with the full story. And I think that's, to me, the biggest piece of this. And my, my wife, Jennifer, was so adamant from the beginning that this should not be a sensationalized event. There are so much more about these people that die. Um, and, and I think that's in our coaching with families that we've done, and we're not professionals at this at all, we're just kind of survivors. Um, that's been our focus is to find outlets that will allow the full story to be told in a, in a, in a delicate way, respecting 100% the family wishes. Um, so. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so next question uh, is from Madeline. Madeline writes, I'm reporting a case of groups in WhatsApp and Telegram made by drug sellers uh, to encourage suicide. Young people got engaged to the group to talk about suicide and what they've done is selling the drugs and teaching how to commit suicide. Uh, two young people have already died and families are taking talking to the media. But I have tons of doubts on how to report. What are the main mistakes I could do and how to avoid them? So I'll start with Claudia. Um, Claudia, uh, what can you say about this dilemma? Um, to be honest, I don't know if I'm, I'm the expert on this topic. It seems um, that I'm reminded of a bunch of different um, scares that have been done in the past about like risks posed to children. And they're often blown out of proportion and actually draw more people's attention to the issue than before and like have, an, have the opposite effect of what you're hoping to do in reporting on this issue. So I would say like thoroughly report on whether this is just sort of a, a panic, a moral panic that's happening or whether it is actually a cause for concern. And then, and then from there, I would say um, to follow the, the recommended guidelines, but I, I I don't want to um, act like an authority on this topic. Lana. Um, I think if I understand rightly, I mean, we had, a, a, I suppose, a similar case here, here in the UK where um, we've had a number of deaths, a small number of deaths um, by the use of a, a novel suicide method using a particular drug. And the press have been keen and indeed bereaved families have been keen to, 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 to highlight this issue um, because this drug has been readily available online. And the advice that we have given to journalists is to, to not name the drug or to name any of the particular sites where people can obtain the drug. Um, and the reason being that, you know, the, the, the principles here and, and the regulation applies across the board to all of, you know, all online sites. Um, and also because, of course, I think as, as Claudia was touching on, the risk of running stories about that is likely to signpost other vulnerable people to those websites to buy the drugs. Um, so, 
again, you know, and, and, and Claudia was right, it's about following media guidelines with stories like okay. this. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question is from Chidera. Chidera writes, uh, sometimes in a bid uh, to get emotional stories as journalists, we keep pushing. How does a journalist know when to pause while telling the story of one living with mental illness or a relative of one who has lost someone to death by suicide? Um, Victor, do you want do you have any thoughts? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a kind of interpersonal question, too. I mean, so there are two pieces of this. At what point is a conversation with somebody uh, potentially hurtful to them just by virtue of having the conversation? And then the second piece is what will be the impact of uh, publicizing the information about the situation or the person? So I think we ne you need to use a great deal of sensitivity and common sense. The greater the potential impact of the revelation and the discussion, I think the, the more responsibility there is to uh, be sensitive to the possible risk there could be. You know, I was involved, uh, Oprah and Prince Harry recently released a series on mental health on Apple TV, which I mean, I was an advisor for, and they took great, great pains with all of the people involved who were the subjects of, of the stories to make sure that they completely understood the ramifications of having their stories go public making sure that for the people who had any concern about risk that they had treatment in place when, you know, when they were uh, pursuing these stories. So I, I think again, I mean, uh, unfortunately journalists are under pressure to find dramatic, interesting stories, but I, I think there's always a question of at what cost to both the subjects of the stories and to society. Corey, do you have a quick contribution to that? I, I agree with Victor. Um, I, I don't really have much else to say other than, you know, the, this whole thread here, there, there's two things that have been occurring to me through this conversation. Well, three, actually. One is just incredible gratitude for this panel and the work that you're doing in this conversation today. But then, you know, talking about the underlying issues so that, so that they can be prevented, at, because it, as was, has been discussed so many times, they, so much of this can be prevented and that's been our and that was actually what we were trying to get across the entire time and trying to move as move the journalists away from the the act itself to the cause so that we can get upstream of the cause not only to prevent it from whatever that whatever the cause was but also for for families and other loved ones to be able to recognize it because i would just say this one thing it hasn't come out but because of the deep stigma that suicide holds, there isn't really a community when your family member is at risk of suicide. There's not a natural community of people that you reach out to to say, hey, has your family member ever been like this? You know, what did you do? So it's a, because of that stigma, I would just say there needs to be responsible report. I mean, it's all everything that we've said, but but getting to these issues and this and what can be done to prevent, I think is is really important. But I, yeah. I just said I I just said I didn't have anything to add, and then I went ahead and added a few things. But um, really, really, just so grateful for for that um, for the for the conversation here on that. Okay. Um, oh, can then I that... just can oh, I just add very quickly? We do have guidance on our website. It's one of the resources that we've published. Is working with bereaved families in the aftermath of a suicide. So there is guidance there. You know, lots of things that need to be considered. Good question. Oh. Okay, so while I read the next question, I think it's better if uh, Lona can put any the link, any any important link in the chat uh, box for our readers to quickly uh, for our panel, for our members to quickly access uh, those kinds of resources. If you can quickly get those links. So the next question reads: Does uh, if someone is under psychiatric is receiving psychiatric help for suicidal thoughts, but the patients and their families are willing to talk. Is it okay to write about it or will that sensualize, sensualize, um, sensationalize uh, the issue? I think I'd like to bring Victor <laughs> in this. I, I think that was the last question that I answered. Uh, mm. So uh, I, I don't, 
I believe that that was something we covered. But yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, if if there is if the arc of the story is uh, moving towards the value of treatment, the possibilities, and and sometimes the challenges and frustrations of treatment. But if the arc of the story is that the person is working, uh, you know, and trying to deal with the issues and getting support both from uh, clinical resources and, and from friends and family. Absolutely. It's perfect. It, that's exactly, in fact, what we mean by the kinds of reporting that's consistent with the Papageno effect, that these are the stories of crises, challenges, but getting support, getting help and, you know, moving towards uh, progress. Yeah, there is also a question that I think is also relevant, considering the global nature of, uh, of our attendees. Uh, yeah, Shahino is asked the relevant question about mental health, uh, reporting mental health in parts of the world where uh, mental health is not receiving that much of attention. So how do you think, is there any recommendation that you can give for journalists willing, willing to report on mental health to make it still locally relevant, even though mental health issues are not popular topics to report on? Anybody? Okay, Lona. <laughs> Me? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just putting the link of our resources in and I didn't really hear that. What was it? Okay, the question. Uh, okay, the question. Okay, the question uh, is. I can uh, take it if, if you want. Uh, okay, yes, yeah. please. Victor. Uh, actually, you, it's something, again, I, I want to recommend if people have access to it, that people look at the series that, uh, that Prince Harry and Oprah did on Apple TV because it really looks at mental health challenges and challenges to care and needs around the world. Uh, and, you know, it talks about some of the uh, efforts being uh, done, for example, in Africa, where there's, um, I don't remember, I think it might have been in Nigeria, there's a psychiatrist there who's developed a kind of peer counseling effort uh, that is uh, called the Friendship Bench. Uh, and, you know, it's, I think, valuable to alert people to the fact that these are uh, these problems occur across every culture, across every group, that they're universal. Uh, and that, you know, in places where there aren't resources, we really need to be creative and thoughtful in finding ways to be of support and to be of help. And also, you know, the, the reporting can be used for as advocacy for increasing resources and increasing access to care in places where that has been underemphasized and undervalued. So I think it's important, journalists have play an important role in really improving uh, the, the uh, addressing of needs of people who are dealing with mental health issues. Okay, uh, Lonan, the question is, uh, how, do we, how can journalists drive attention to reporting mental health issues in parts of the world where priority is not given to mental health? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a really difficult issue to get around. And obviously there will be local, um, cultural and re religious aspects impacting on that. Um, and I, I'm certainly not um, an expert on, on media reporting internationally. Um, but, but I think my advice would be to, to, to be aiming for, you know, starting this narrative because there won't be a corner of the world where there aren't issues experienced around mental health struggles um, and particularly in, in this time with a global epidemic um, you know maybe seizing opportunities of that you know where it's a global issue does that create other opportunities to to bring that narrative in where it may otherwise be more challenging okay but, you know, uh, thank you yeah so Thank you uh, for that. So the last question for Victor is, is um, what uh, options and in terms of uh, prevention uh, toolkit available in preventing uh, mental, uh, sorry, in preventing uh, suicide that um, maybe journalists willing to report uh, from the prevention angle uh, and also start looking at? 
Well, again, there are efforts of groups like, uh, you know, like Samaritans, which is international, but primarily based in the UK. Uh, there's a wonderful group in um, Australia called Origin, O-R-Y-G-E-N, which has done really uh, valuable work around uh, actually social media. They've done work around, put out a guide for Instagram and using that safely. Uh, you know, find good, responsible organizations that are out there. In the United States, the Ad Council, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, have put out some nice efforts uh, like something called Whatever Gets You Talking. There are efforts around means restriction. Uh, there's, a, again, a program called End, End Family Fire about safe storage of firearms that's uh, happening in the United States. I'm part of an effort at the Stanford Department of Psychiatry on mental health and media. So find responsible outlets that you know, provide safe, responsible information. And there are uh, lists internationally of hotlines through the International Association for Suicide Prevention. Uh, so the hotlines are available in, in almost every country. Uh, so if you do a bit of research, you can find really excellent resources online. You just need to be careful that they are responsible and, you know, and, and reasonable organizations and not, you know, somebody who's just set up uh, their own shop in some way. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for that, Victor. And for Claudia, uh, what are your final words? What are, what will you discuss, what are your last remarks to, uh, for our journalists today? My big takeaway is for those of you who have learned anything from this session to please bring this to your local newsrooms and your communities, because I think this is just an issue that not enough reporters have had to think about maybe because they haven't had to report on this topic. But in the event that they do in the future, they will be all the more prepared for having had this conversation. Um, and so I, I hope this has been valuable for you all. Lana. Thank you so much for those who have joined us for taking the time um, and, and yeah, absolutely echo what Claudia is saying, you know, share, share what you've learned today with, with your colleagues in the newsroom um, and remind everybody that you, you can report on this topic responsibly it is possible to do that this is not about shutting the topic down but thank you and we are back to where we started Corey oh um depending on the timing of these the, the reporting um just remember that there are people and families that are in an incredible amount of grief and as one who went through this process, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done on top of one of the hardest things I'd ever done in a 24 hour period and continues to be very painful. So it, just be sensitive, um, be sensitive to it and, and don't, don't push um, the families on details. It's just not, it's not what the reporting should be about anyway, but just, just, that, that'd be my final comments. So I really want to appreciate uh, all, our web, all our panelists for taking our time uh, to be with us to discuss uh, this uh, very, very important issue. And as shown in the remarks of our, of our members, of our participants, uh, this is a well-received and much needed um, discussion uh, that needs to happen. And we are glad that we are starting this conversation that I really believe uh, is not going to end here. Over the course of time, we'll continue to uh, have this continual conversation around how to responsibly report on mental health uh, in general. And uh, for so I would uh, encourage all our uh, participants uh, to check out the ICFJ uh, Global Health Crisis uh, Reporting Forum. And um, so this is a uh, this is the link. Uh, I just put the link in the chat button for the ICJ Global Crisis Reporting from. If you are not part of the group, please endeavor to join. And I also encourage you to learn more about the ICJ 
ICFJ, International Center for Journalists, uh, by visiting icfj.org. We also have the International Journalist Network, IGNet, uh, that provides resources uh, for journalists uh, and guidelines on reporting uh, key issues like mental health. So you can do that by visiting www.ignet.org. I'm really, really glad uh, that we are having this conversation and we will continually bring our topical issues uh, to you so that we can improve our journalists' uh, reporting skills. And on behalf of the entire ICFJ team, I say thank you very much for joining us. For those that were asking about the video, yes, uh, by the next 24 hours, the video will be available uh, for you to replay on the YouTube uh, channel of ICFJ. Uh, if you are in the if you are in the Facebook group, we are going to share the link when the video goes live so that you can replay and further share it with your colleagues. So thank you very much. And uh, we are out in five second countdown, five, four, three, two, one. We are out.